Hi, this lecture is um, exploring the uh, main common uh, themes of uh, Willard Swartley's uh, chapters in the um, Covenant of Peace that we covered this week. Um, this uh, chapters are um, intended mainly for, for two purposes. Um, you know, and the reason why I had you read them. One, the, the first purpose is to give you a sense of how biblical scholars actually um, look at the Bible in um, framing their arguments. So, for example, if they're going to say that the um, Gospel of John has a certain um, theme and that certain theme is uh, sort of um, consistent throughout the Gospel of John and is different from, let's say, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that this theme is present in um, Christianity generally in these specific ways, um, there's a specific kind of way that that happens. Um, and that is, um, you, you know, actually rooted in um, the text itself and how the text um, enables and, um, you know, sort of frames its analysis. And we're going to get into that in a second. So, so it, at some level, it's sort of giving you a chance to actually look at the work of an actual biblical scholar um, and see how that work is actually done. Because we're going to be bumping up against this, um, you know, for the rest of the semester, this sort of, you know, statement that people are going to make statements about, okay, Christianity or the Bible says this or this or this about nonviolence. And I want to, you know, show you how a scholar actually does that work so you have a sense of what they're actually talking about. And maybe you could disagree with them or what have you, but you know how the tool works. The second point is that following on um, Armstrong's theme that in, in inherently religion as a concept, as a construct, is not itself violent, Swartley, um, with his, his book here, really tries to sort of push the thesis that contrary to, um, you know, the developments of Christianity, which we're going to see in future weeks where Christianity becomes sort of a religion of the state and gets bound up in the concerns of the state and what have you, leading to the kinds of interventions that, um, you know, uh, will happen in the future, like, for example, the Crusades, like, for example, the, the wars of religion in the 1500s and what have you, um, where people will find within the text justification for um, their acts of violence and, and how they respond violently. Um, Swartley is making the argument in, in this book that, um, in actuality, the Christian scriptures are inherently scriptures of peace. They're inherently scriptures um, that emphasize nonviolence. And, um, you know, that inherently, if anyone is actually doing any violence in the text, it is always Yahweh um, who is doing the violence on behalf, on behalf, sorry, of Yahweh. Yahweh is doing violence, and Yahweh has Yahweh's own intents and reasons to do violence, but that and the scriptures themselves are pretty clear that humans are not to be violent themselves. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, Swartley's argument. So that's kind of the, um, the, the that second reason is sort of just as important as the first, um, because I want you to see the, um, these sort of the, these arguments that are presented um, against this common thesis that religion is inherently violent so that you can start looking at um, how one can frame an understanding of, you know, Christianity as a religion of peace, and how can one can build a framework of doing peacemaking upon Christianity itself? So, um, it's a bit of a quick overview on, on how this actually works. There's there, there's um, two different uh, lenses or or um, I guess perspectives that often um, are are used when when you know people are are. Um, looking at and addressing biblical texts. One is uh, this uh, um, this tool known as exegesis. And you've probably already done exegesis um, in a literature class or you know um, you've pulled apart the the um, the meaning of um, a poem in English class or what have you. And it's the same kind of idea. Exegesis at core is simply trying to see what the text itself is trying to say, and you're trying to extract the meaning from the um, from the text. 
So what you're going to be looking at is not only trying to you know look at the definitions of words, but you're also going to be looking at um, what the words themselves might have meant when they were first written. And so you get you know if as close as possible to sort of you know if anything can be said to be an original intent, or you know that uh, you, you can sort of sometimes even start picking apart the text closely enough looking at different words, looking at the, um, the time frames when certain words were used versus others. So, you know, like for example, the word forsooth is a word that you may have heard, but it is very much of a time that is not our own. So if I'm using, throwing around the word forsooth, then um, I'm using it, at a, you know, in a way that like now, um, I would be using it sort of referencing a time when the word used to exist. Um, so you can actually look at the words themselves that are used within texts and you can pinpoint when that word itself or the phrasing around that word was used because those words are often used for, you know, in certain times in certain ways. So you're doing a lot of historical analysis and, 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 and you're trying to pull sort of information out. Now there's another, so the, the flip would be eisegesis. And eisegesis is sort of, at some level, trying to read into the text uh, some understanding. Um, and again, we, 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 we all do that. Um, you know, if we're looking at a poem and we're trying to find meaning in the poem, and we say, oh, this, this poem really means something to me because it speaks to this or that or the other aspect of, of my own experience, then you're doing eisegesis. Um, and in terms of biblical um, texts, what we often find eisegesis is, um, you know, is sort of this, I am, uh, you know, inherently going to be approaching a text from a certain lens. It's, it's, it's impossible not to. We all have a certain um, context or frame that we're, you know, um, that sort of shapes the way that we view and understand the world. And that frame is going to um, inform what we're, you know, how we read a text. So at some level, I could be looking at the same text as, let's say, even my spouse. And even though our experiences are so very similar, um, inherently, because my spouse is a different person than me, um, we're going to view the text from a you know, potentially very different perspective. But you know, beyond just the fact that people are different and individuals are different, there is sort of a, 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 sort of a, a, a general framing of a text. For example, as a, a, um, a certain form of Christian, I might look at a text and view it similarly to somebody who is coming from a, a, you know that similar form. So if I'm as a as a as a as a Quaker who's also Christian, I might be looking at a text and have a similar understanding of it as somebody else, or I, or I might be bringing to the text similar um, sort of biases and assumptions and what have you. So if we're looking for like a Quaker interpretation of a text, that's at some level one can make the argument that's eisegesis. Um, now, what Swartley is trying to do here is trying to employ both exegesis and eisegesis together. Um, Swartley's, you know, eisegesis or eisegetical approach is pretty obvious. He states it from the outset. He's um, an Anabaptist. He's a he's a pacifist, and you know he has gathered from the biblical text this feeling that um, you know this text is, 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 is telling him that he should be nonviolent and um, how he reads the text is through this lens of viewing it as inherently nonviolent. So what he's trying to do is he's saying, okay, this is my eisegetical lens. Can we find within the text itself exegetical evidence which would sort of demonstrate that my eisegetical lens is not incorrect? So he's trying to marry, so, or at least bring them into some sense of alignment. Um, and uh, an element of that that we really have to, you know, you really have to sort of at some level um, wrestle with is that um, the text, the biblical text is incredibly complicated. There is no one biblical voice on anything because what we understand to be the Bible is, um, you know, potentially vastly different depending on um, who you're, you are, what religion you're coming from, and what your context is. 
So for example, um, a Jewish person is going to only look at the book as the Torah and is only going to look at the scriptures that are included in what Christians traditionally call the Old Testament. But it's not old to Jews because there is no New Testament. This is their testament. This is their book. So if we talk about the Jewish Bible, we're talking about, you know, just the um, the books of, um, you know, from around Genesis to the minor prophets in a Christian framing. Now, Jews will take all those individual books, and again, the Bible is not one book. It is a library of multitudes of books written in multitude, like across thousands of years, in, you know, numerous different um, literary forms. There's poetry, there's um, um, prophetic work, there's history, um, there's prehistorical uh, stuff, there's myth. It's, it's, it, it's a jumble of, uh, it's, it's aphoristic statements like you find in Proverbs. Um, it's a jumble of a variety of different forms um, from thousands of years of multiple different perspectives on this one main question of how has a people experienced um, their God known as Yahweh? Okay. Now, if you're looking at it from a Christian perspective, you have you know the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, again, Christian Bible is going to put the books in a certain order in the Old Testament that is vastly different from what Jews are going to put in um, you know a Jewish Bible. It even even the order itself is different. And um, but Christians have an Old Testament and a New Testament. But Christians, depending on the tradition, some traditions, um, for example, the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church, include books that are, you know, n um, not seen as, um, you know, properly, fully scriptural from, you know, um, Protestant perspectives. So the Protestant Bible has like 66 books and has a very specific set of what those are and there's a framing there and again in different forms. The New Testament has Gospels which are basically um, you know uh, stories of um, a divine figure who comes to earth and sort of teaches and wrestles with you know sort of spiritual forces you know and at some level you know like it reaches a climax and then you know, there's a, a resolution, which is sort of the, the victory of the divine figure. Yes, the idea of a gospel, this is not just a Christian thing. This framing of the story has similarities, has, has other, you know, um, has a, a similar uh, books that are written about, you know, or, or, or similar stories in, in other traditions that are written similarly. So, for example, you know, um, Rome has, has has similar framings of you know the the divine man, um, and 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 his sort of you know um, birth and childhood and you know um, adulthood as as a teacher and and death and, and all that. So, um, and then of course there's the the, um, the epistles, which is just basically a fancy word for for letters, and then you go all the way through. Um, to the uh, the book of Revelation, which is an apocalyptic literature, uh, and apocalyptic is itself a framing that you find throughout you know the biblical text. Where the book of Daniel is seen as apocalyptic, um, uh, certain chapters within the book of um, Ezekiel are seen as apocalyptic, and um, you know this idea of apocalypse also a revealing. You know, apocalyptic is just sort of a, you know, a, a a revealing of some of the 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 what is underneath the the true reality of the world. Okay, so um, the if you are in the uh, Roman Catholic and the um, the uh, you know Roman Catholic in, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, you're going to include books that you know the into the um, the Old Testament that the Protestants are going to call the Apocrypha. They're going to put them off to the side. So when we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about a document that is created over thousands of years, and the Christian texts themselves are created over like a good almost 120 year time span, okay? So um, they actually are building from stories that um, had, had existed as oral histories you know, sort of even during, you know, the life of the person that we historically say, you know, um, is known as Jesus, that then, 
you know, sort of splinter and, 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 and shape off into these different communities as Christianity spreads across the Roman Empire. So you cannot say there is one biblical theme, generally, okay? There's always going to be um, arguments that could be made against it. So the best you can do is say that um, you feel as if there's a general sort of thrust um, within a text that moves in a certain direction. Um, it's a difficult argument to make, and that's one reason why, you know, Swartley is, you know, has to spend 400-something pages making the argument. Um, and what he does is he doesn't actually, you know, say that these other um, understandings of um, the role of violence and peace within Christianity, um, which maybe defend violence or say that, you know, there is as much violence as there is um, peace in the text as, as we see um, Swartley trying to address in, um, you know, both chapter one and chapter two. Um, he's not saying they're wrong. He's just trying to bring up a different argument. And he says, actually, if you look at it in this frame, you can see that generally there is sort of this, this thrust and theme um, and these other you know, these other uh, pieces, these other passages can be explained in, you know, a broader perspective if you look at it in this this certain way. And, and he builds like a framework of how to view this, you know, the, the text as a, a document of peace. Um, I think it's a pretty persuasive argument, but again, we're saying that, you know, um, I'm at, at core saying that you, you cannot say that, the, you know, the Bible has any one main theme, um, that that theme is always going to be undercut by other words inside it. Um, so as much as one can say that there is a thrust or general concept or theme in anywhere in, in, in the text, you know, I think you can make the argument that, that, that peace is a consistent argument, but it may not be the only argument. Okay, so... Um, Swartley covers a great deal of thematic content. We don't need to go into too much um, terrible depth there because Swartley really does a good job kind of, you know, building it out. But but to kind of, you know, summarize it, um, he starts off with this sort of saying that Jesus as both a concept, so the idea of the Messiah. And we'll look at Messiah a bit more detail um, I'd say probably next week when we're looking at um, the rise of Christianity. But we covered the Messiah a little bit in um, this this last chapter when we're looking at uh, the role of Cyrus as a, a savior figure. But next, um, you know, next week, you know, um, I'm going to cover a lot more of the 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 um, um, the messianic. Uh, framing in and, and the apocalyptic framing in early um, Christian work, um, and and at the time of the the um, the early church. So, but if we think about the idea of Jesus as like a concept of you know the divine figure, the the, the Messiah, and you also align that alongside the historical person that is whose story is told in you know multiple different framings in the New Testament. Um, Swartley argues that you can find three main themes. All right? There's a theme of the reign of God or the kingdom of God. Um, there's the theme of gospel. And there's the theme of peace. Now, I'm going to cover the framing of the reign of God um, in a bit more detail um, in the next, again, next week's um, lecture. But what you're really looking at is... Um, this idea that that um, um, Armstrong starts to kind of toy with um, when she's examining Yahweh and its role and, and Yahweh's role in, in Judaism, this sense that there is a will or there is a desire of Yahweh for Yahweh's people, okay, and that this will has a certain framing and has a certain way of being and has certain expectations. So the reign of God, or the kingdom of God, is just a way of viewing how to be and how the world should be, which is aligned with the desire and will of, of God, okay? So um, what that generally looks like 
um, you're, you know, Swartley kind of builds that argument out, like what actually does the random crowd look like? Now, this is an argument that is, um, has consistently been sort of um, worked through with um, any number of, uh, I mean, for 2,000 years, what is Jesus talking about with the reign of God? Um, so it, it is contested territory. Swartley um, presents one argument of what that might possibly be. Um, and he talks about ideas of um, the role of um, uh, uh, the Messiah, um, where the Messiah emerges from um, in Messianic Judaism, um, and you know specifically how the Messiah is explored in um, second and third Isaiah. Um, and when I say second and third, I want to pull back just a second, you know, so that we see how these texts are are, are made. Um, ancient texts are not actually often written by the person who you know, whose name they are ascribed to. Um, oftentimes, you'll find texts that are written, um, you know, that, that, that say they are written by a certain historical person. And what they really mean is that the, um, the historical, they're, they're, the people who wrote the thing um, were trying to give it authority and weight. So they assigned a historical person you know, um, that would, um, they think, agree with them and that would, you know, their ideas would fit within the, you know, the broader context of the work itself. So, you know, um, for example, um, the Gospels are related to people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These were not written by dudes named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're written by communities, which might have been headed by people who, with the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, but the community itself is sort of saying, you know, um, we are writing as if we are this person. Um, this also happens with the prophetic works, particularly the, you know, the book of Isaiah. That Isaiah was... And a, you know a prophet and um, the first Isaiah which is like the first third of the book of Isaiah it was actually prophecies expressed by the prophet Isaiah this historical person but the Isaiah was such a powerful prophet and um, was seen as being someone who could really speak to some powerful themes and, and ideas and, and, and really spoke from um, this place of speaking you know from God, at serving as God's voice, which is what um, prophets are supposed to do, um, that later, after people sort of um, had moved on and time had moved on, they wanted to continue these kinds of themes that First Isaiah explored in their prophetic work, and they, they, they have other prophetic ideas, they have other prophets who might speak who are unnamed, but they will, you know, take them and ascribe them to Isaiah in order to give them weight. Because, you know, if somebody is a weighty person within the ancient world, then people are going to pay attention to them. So our modern day assumptions of what is historical, meaning did it actually happen? Was it, you know, some sense of fact, scientific fact, does not have any role in ancient the ancient world in the same way at, at all. Okay? Who wrote a text? It, it, it does not matter in the same way, okay? Um, you know, you could conceivably ascribe it to anyone, and if it was somebody that was well-known, it's just more likely that it's going to be read. So, um, the books of 2nd and 3rd Isaiah are a part of Isaiah, but it's sort of a, um, uh, scholars have pulled them apart through, you know, exegetical work, and have seen that 2nd Isaiah uses different words, different themes, different what have you, but they, um, they, they follow on from 1st Isaiah, but are obviously in a different context. And 3rd Isaiah, even more so, is, again, you know, using similar kinds of ways of speaking, but using very particularly different words, very particularly different context, and um, the voice, even, of the writer is, 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 is very different. But they pushed three different books together and said, Isaiah, okay? So... Um, when uh, Swartley's talking about the reign of God, 
um, he starts exploring how this idea exists, um, this I the sense of like, what is the will of Yahweh for Yahweh's people, um, both in Isaiah and um, in the, um, the apocalyptic, um, which, and, and he explores some of the, the background and the history, which again, we're gonna touch on next week a little bit more, the rise of Christianity, but we also touched a little bit um, at the end of last week's lecture, and Fortley really kind of covers it. So, you know, like this apocalyptic is sort of this, this idea of like, you know, um, it often emerges in a time of great ferment and change, um, that uh, people are, are looking to sort of understand um, the world differently and understand and have, you know, God reveal, uh, apocalypse also is just literally just the, you know, the word reveal. Hence, you know, the, the revelation, Reve, the book of Revelation is also known as the apocalypse of John, is the revelation of John. Um, and the, you know, so what we, you know, the, it's sort of this, this, this revealing of what is God's plan for the world um, in a more comprehensive way. So you've got, um, you know, in this vision of the reign of God, you've got the apocalyptic playing, as well as you've got sort of this, um, you know, this Messiah and um, this sort of sense of, um, you know, that, that God was going to, you know, sort of um, bring about God's will on earth directly. God was going to intervene directly and was going to do so in a incredibly powerful, dynamic um, way, um, in a way that it could be seen in the apocalyptic. Okay, all right, so there's that part. And then gospel... Um, Swartley kind of covers this idea. Gospel meaning just basically gospel is just good news. The word just means good news. But the idea of gospel develops from this idea of what is the, you know, what is good news for God's people. So, you know, a, a um, Jesus being the gospel is linked to Jesus being, you know, literally this the sense of the divine in the human and so, you know, as opposed to having a prophet speak the words of God that are given to the prophet, Jesus is sort of taking on this role as God speaking the words of God through a human, um, you know, through a, a human medium. So at some level, Jesus is himself gospel. He is himself embodying this idea of the good news, you know, the will of God, the reign of God coming through the person of Jesus, but also the words of Jesus wind up being seen as the good news, um, the, the 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 news which is good because it is bringing the will of God into the world, um, and it is news that is also potentially quite distressing, potentially quite overwhelming, and um, likely radical and revolutionary. So, gospel is itself radical, revolutionary, um, complicated, and um, going to bring about significant change. Um, now, the gospel idea sort of, you know, Swartley kind of covers, uh, you know, how how gospel, these texts sort of, you know, develop and, and, and morph over time, you know, that originally, you know, the first gospel is the gospel of Mark, and it's written around 30 years after Jesus' death by the community of people who, you know, were linked to someone that they knew as Mark. Um, and it has a very particular frame of who Jesus is and what Jesus' ideas are. As time progresses, other, you know, um, communities come in, other, you know, books are, are written about um, this person known as Jesus and, and, and other ways of viewing and understanding and interpreting the, the gospel the good news of Jesus and what that gospel looks like in terms of the reign of God, they, they, they will emerge. And then you have, as you know, Swartley says, a vastly different vision of who Jesus was in the John, in, in the gospel of John versus what are seen as the synoptics, meaning uh, just that they are similar. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell a similar story. Um, there's a lot of overlap between, um, you know, how the book is written. Um, whereas John is, you know, on a, a very different framing. Um, now, the the just a, 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 a bit of a note pulling away. I said before that the the Bible is intentionally um, 
sort of you know it, or it is inherently um, covering a great deal of of um, of ground that it's very um, diverse there's a lot of different uh, forms in there and it covers a great deal of time um, and the people who eventually pulled together what is known as the canon and canon just means rule or marker so to seen as what is you know um, what is in and what is out you know what is what meets the standard um, of you know the the books that should be seen as holy scripture and what are is not seen when they when they pull together the the canon of scripture um, they are they're building off of you know how Jewish people had already developed the um, the vision of the Torah where they're pulling together multiple different perspectives on even one event. So for example, there's in the book of Genesis, there's two creation stories. Um, and in uh, the, um, you know, the, the prophet Micah tells a similar um, prophetic, um, you know, uh, utterance as you'll find in the book of Isaiah. Many of the themes, you know, in, um, uh, you know, the book of Exodus are covered again in the book of Deuteronomy, but differently. Um, many of the incidents that are explored in um, the books of First and Second Kings are also explored in the books of First and Second Chronicles, but again, from a very different perspective. So you have people who are already used to there being multiple voices on, you know, the you know, one event or on one experience or what have you. So when they're pulling together the 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 canon, you intentionally you, they're intentionally trying to bring in these different voices. To have a diversity of perspective, so at core, the Bible is a diverse document. Um, now, Swartley covers um, at this point the rest of the the chapters is looking at um, the difference between um, the the difference and the overlap um, between two different visions of what peace is. One um, is this Hebrew vision of shalom. And all that flows into it and out of it. And on page 30, you see um, Swartley's idea of what um, shalom means in the biblical text. It is multiple. It is, um, I believe that uh, Swartley uses the word, it is iridescent. There are multiple ways that shalom can be understood and translated. It is a word that contains a great deal. Because what it really says, shalom at core, is the kingdom of God. Shalom is a Hebrew word which encapsulates the peace that will exist within the context of when God's will for the creation actually emerges. All right? Shalom is the reign of God. So that can include any number, a variety of different ideas. Now, um, Swartley on page 30 expresses that um, what are the ideas that come into Shalom are righteousness and justice, the idea of chesed, um, emuna, or, or grace, um, sort of uh, God's, um, God's gift to humanity, God's, God's desire to, to be gifting to humanity, this, you know, this vision of chesed, of, of, of uh, you know, God gifting and, and giving of God's self to humanity. Um, and then the idea of covenant, the idea of being in a relationship um, with the divine where um, there are commitments on both sides. Um, this isn't contractual. A covenant goes deeper. You at your very core, who you are as a person, is committed to the divine, and the divine is committed to you who you are inherently. This isn't like a business relationship. You, you, you exist as a person in relationship, deep relationship with expectations and um, inevitable frames of mind that emerge from that. So that's a sort of sense of covenant. So you have righteousness and justice, grace, giftedness, chesed, and covenant, the relationship with God, all come into shalom. And what emerges from shalom are um, God's salvation, 
God saving you from evil and God, you know, ensuring that you will be present in the, um, you know, in, you know, God's afterlife. Um, eschatological. And the, the eschaton is um, just a Greek word meaning um, the, uh, the, the, when, when time ends. Okay. So eschatological is often seen as like the end of the world. But it's not just the end of all things. The eschaton is sort of similar to or analogous to um, an end of something, an end of a way of being. And even at the end of the book of Revelations, it is not the end of all things. Because in chapters 20 and 21, the New Jerusalem emerges and you know people emerge into the new jerusalem that is the um the the new beginning the the birth that emerges from the end of earthly existence so one can have an eschaton for example an, an eschatological moment is um you are moving from high school into college the person you were in high school is ending that time, that context, that whole frame of being is coming to a conclusion. But through that time of ending, a new time is emerging. So eschatons are sort of these, these points of intersect between one time and another. There's, an, you know, between a death and a beginning. So what emerges from shalom, what, what, what you know, sort of is an element of how shalom, how shalom works in real life, is this idea of God being, you know, sort of saving us um, you know, uh, that, you know, that when Shalom, when the reign of God occurs, it'll be, um, you know, we are free from evil. It will be the end of something. Um, so it'll be an end of this time of, you know, non reign of God, um, and the beginning of another moment. And it will also be sort of this, this, you know, this idea of like, um, the kingdom will actually have, have emerged. Okay. So shalom has sort of elements again, justice or justice, grace, relationship with God, which leads to the salvation of God and the coming of the new world, which is the kingdom of God. Um, now, this overwhelming vision of shalom and, and peace does not in any way correlate with what Rome and what empires and imperial visions of peace are. Shalom is a time when you literally using, you know, the, the, the phrasing in the book of Isaiah, when, you know, um, lion will lie down next to the lamb and, you know, a children will, you know, a child will lead them. It's, it's this time on the holy mountain where everything, all the relationships of predation and evil and, um, you know, the desire for, you know, taking over another, all of those are ended. So thus the lion becomes, you know, a non-predatory being in the kingdom of God. Because what is understood as, you know, who that, that lion is, ends, dies, and the lion is now reborn in this new age. Non-predatory, non-death related, non-violent. The Pax Romana, however, this sort of the Roman peace, the peace of the empire, is all about oppression, all about ending the ability of others to exist um, as, you know, rebellious elements. That, you know, the Roman peace is everyone in lockstep, you have conformity, you have, you know, sort of a sense of an overwhelming oppression um, and, and sameness. Okay, that's not peace in the shalom sense. It's much more a um, um, just a lack of overt, violent war. So even when you know, um, even in, in our modern times, when we talk about peace, a Christian Jewish vision of peace is much more comprehensive. So we actually have not had times moments of peace in our our you know um, country's history because we someone has been oppressed we have been oppressing someone we've had a military um, state 
you know, we, we've had, you know, we've had, you know, a state of military and we've had this sort of this oppression of, you know, sort of um, slavery and racism and, and, and all of that. Okay. So then Shalom moves to the idea of um, Irene, which is a Latin, um, sorry, a Greek, excuse me, a Greek, um, the Latin is Pax um, for peace, um, a Greek vision of peace. And these ideas are um, what goes into Irene is again similar sort of what you know like um, the, the the idea of peace is this sort of righteousness, justice, um, and and this you know vision of Irene is we we see this really presented and and, and explored in great detail in in um, in Paul's writing and Paul is specifically this sort of you know f you know he's this Roman citizen this worldly person who speaks Koine Greek and Koine Greek is just the the um, the um, uh, the form of Greek that is used in this time um, in the, the you know like first century CE um, this idea of righteousness and justice again salvation and grace and um, this this vision of what 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 um, Paul ascribe, envisions as the new covenant. Um, so and he's he's bringing in he, he's he's sort of framing this vision of Irene and and and, and sort of comparing it to um, you know shalom. So he's bringing the shalom idea into and incorporating it into this Greek word Irene. Um, so he's bringing in the idea of covenant and that covenantal you know. Um, committed relationship that we see between God, um, you know, Yahweh and Yahweh's people. Um, and we're saying that, you know, and Paul's saying that the new covenant is a relationship between humanity and um, and God through the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, th th that is this new covenantal relationship that we see emerge in this time of Rene, which is similar to Shalom, but it is now read through the lens of Jesus. And what emerges from this sort of gospel of peace, this this sort of um, you know um, this good news of what emerges from Jesus' existence on the earth, is um, you know sort of a um, a new way of being. So you've got this new sense of a love of God, a love of neighbor, a love of enemy, an overwhelming sense of love. Um, you know you have a sense of um, Faith, hope, a, sort of a sense of a, a harmony, a balance. Again, similar to the idea of Isaiah, where everything is sort of balanced, and um, you don't have uh, power structures, you don't have oppressive, um, you know, visions of sort of you know um, what is going to be um, oppressing another. There is no death, there is no destruction, and then you have emerging from that also a sense of a, this sort of wholeness. So you have almost a a healing of the earth, a healing of the creation. Through um, this 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 vision of Irene that that um, Paul is sort of expressing, again, it's sort of he's reading Shalom through this you know um, Greek idea of, of of peace, and Shalom is now being read through the person of Jesus. So Shalom isn't just relationship to God will it bring about God's will, but that it has a specific face now. So shalom specifically looks like the kind of love that Jesus has and expresses. Specifically looks like the kind of sort of harmony that Jesus is talking about um, between all people. The sort of this vision of all people being equal before uh, before God and 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 the world being whole and and united. So you know this vision of you know Jesus as somebody who who heals who who um, who heals the earth. This is ecological as well as medical. Um, so the vision of Irene is similar to Shalom, but, but it's almost sort of shifted because it really only makes sense through the, the, you know, the lens of Jesus. So you have these two visions of, of peace in the, um, the Jewish and Christian scriptures that um, are vastly different from the vision of peace in the Roman one. So what, what Swartley sees in the um, the New Testament is this this expression of shalom, which is then read into Irene, and and he sees that they you know this vision of Irene is sort of like um, a a certain framing of um, of peace that will lead to a a new world, a a new way of being, um, 
And uh, so Swartley says that this sort of new way of being, which is peace, which is controlled by God, um, this is the literally the the whole purpose of Jesus's sort of life on earth. So he says at core, because Jesus was about inaugurating, you know, the shalom of God and transitioning and shifting it and, and then sort of moving it into this vision of Irene, at core, nothing can be non and nothing can be violent if it's based and rooted in what, you know, Jesus's vision of overwhelming love, harmony, and wholeness. Um, now, there's a challenge, of course, that is brought forth that Swartley deals with, is that there are, um, you know, Swartley recognizes that there's themes of both violence and nonviolence in the New Testament. Um, he covers the ground here and he discusses his own response. Basically, um, that while the existence of war in New Testament society is acknowledged, and Jesus literally, you know, it says there, you know, like, a, um, I come not to bring peace but a sword. Um, he does reference the existence of um, a passage where um, um, where Peter and other apostles um, are, uh, you know, holding up a sword at the um, in the uh, um, Garden of Gethsemane, and you know, when Peter says, "I have a sword," and Jesus says, "It is enough," so he's acknowledging that these things exist, um, but um, he. He also says that that's not saying that, that Jesus is saying you should use them, okay? Um, every single one of these instances can be explained and understood in a different framing. So even when Paul talks about putting on the, um, you know, the, the armor of Christ and he talks about a sword as a part of that armor, it is specifically like it's like a dagger, um, you know, it is literally like it is not intended as an offensive weapon. It is just seen as literally what one would put on as defense back then. You'd, you'd have armor plating, you'd have a helmet on, you'd have a tiny little sword just to defend yourself. Okay? Um, each of these instances are more seen as using the metaphors of the time than specifically as a, um, an, a uh, defense of, you know, violence. Also, um, Swartley acknowledges that Jesus is kind of quite forceful and direct. He destroys property. Um, he is direct in his language. Um, he uh, tosses the money changers out of the, um, you know, the, uh, the temple. And at core, he's saying, you know, in this sort of defense of this, he's saying that Jesus got pissed. Jesus got angry. And um, Jesus is simply channeling the anger that Yahweh has and that we see Yahweh have through the Old Testament and into the New, where Yahweh is, is angry at evil, angry at injustice, angry at um, you know, violence. Um, Yahweh does not desire that. So Jesus, if we see Jesus as sort of, you know, being this sort of incarnation of God, then Jesus is channeling Yahweh through that not actually allowing that to be a human response. Um, and um, there's sort of this, this overall insistence that one can be fervent and strident in one's language as well without actually advocating violence against people. It's saying that you can be angry, you can be pissed, you can raise your voice, but that doesn't mean that you're violent inherently. Um, and a sort of acknowledging that social division, the social division that emerges when Jesus comes, you know, sort of at, kind of like sets off a, a, a chain reaction of like complications and, and division and between families and stuff. That's not violence. That's just simply, you know, what will happen when, um, you know, God emerges into the world and people are forced to adapt. So any time that there's any kind of, you know, direct violence... Um, Swartley in the New Testament, Swartley consistently points it to this is God acting as the violent one and not actually allowing humans to do so. That's Swartley's entire main theme there, okay? Um, and, 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 and he develops it in, in further detail. Um, but really, the main point, and you need to really extract from this, is that um, at core, Swartley argues, and I think persuasively, that um, 
the Christian scriptures preach a message of this overwhelming, over sort of overpowering vision of peace and wholeness and um, of a new world that is, you know, bound up in God's um, vision for what, you know, what the world should be. And that it is not inherently actually advocating for or pursuing violence. Now we're going to see how Armstrong wrestles with this um, as Christianity becomes more of a, as it emerges in, in the next uh, section, and also becomes the imperial religion. And um, we're going to see how famous thought, um, thinkers like um, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, and Augustine wrestled with this question. Um, both of them, of course, are wrestling with a time after um, Christianity has become the imperial religion. So they're wrestling with, you know, with this time of, you know, how do we, how do we still maintain these these core concepts of the tradition while also dealing with the fact that on the ground we're the imperial power, and the imperial power demands certain expectations of behavior, including being violent if need be. So we'll see how um, Armstrong tries to sort of engage with this question and say that again, still. What we're seeing, if we see violence at the hands of religion, is much more the state and other entities coming in to impose the violence into the religion, and not that it's actually emerging from the religion itself. 